And thanks to a certain amount of confusion, I have ended up losing, ooh, eight minutes, and this is a 40-minute talk in a 50-minute slot, so I think we'll be fine. Anyway, so, um, this talk is called DevOps Logique. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing that kind of entertains me is, basically, the core of the DevOps movement is basically, so far as I can see, doing operations right, except the rest of the world has finally noticed what the people who were doing operations right for the past 10 years were doing, and stuck a fancy name on it. So, you know, I've, since, since obviously I am MST and therefore right by definition, I'm going to stick the fancy name on my operation stuff. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. There, there, was a, there was a project called infrastructures.org um, that I, 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 fir I first joined the mailing list ooh, about 12 years ago. I have no idea if it's still going. But at that point, that was where the um, people who were doing sort of systems automation stuff um, tended to hang about and um, chat about things. So um, back in those days, CF Engine and BF BCFG were kind of the main things that people were using. I'm not sure that there's going to be that many people here who even remember them anymore. Um, but um, they, they both basically did the job. The um, config syntax is scared the hell out of people. Um, okay, I'm a Perl programmer, so I'm not scared of syntax. Uh, <laughs> but um, they, they, they were in kind of interesting tools, but they, they were what I regard as sort of the first generation of things. Um, and the guys who ran the list had this fascinating system called ISConf, um, whose goal was basically absolute predictability. So... Um, ISConf had a really fascinating thing. It, 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 was an, it was an automation tool, but it only had two commands. You had snap, which ensured a particular file was um, on the file system in a particular location, and you had an exec, you had exec which ran a particular command. So the idea was you started off with a gold image, that was, you know, your base system image and then built up the state you wanted through just put this file here, run this command. Very, very stupid, but very predictable. Um, and people sort of looked at this and went, are we, are we really sure that that's, that's going to be sufficient? Um, and they proved it was by being the um, fastest team to get their, disa their disaster recovery site back up after September the 11th. Um, because one of their primary customers was headquartered in one of the towers. So um, about three hours later, they had, they had basically the backup site, um, which was mostly secretarial staff. All of those machines were up to spec to run engineering and finance work. Um, so yeah, the, the, the machines were there for the staff who actually survived. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's a fascinating idea, and I'm, I'm sort of... I, I, I almost feel like they were ahead of their time because if, if you look at the way ISConf works, it's almost identical to the idea of um, the way you use a script to build Docker containers, um, except for the fact that they did it on bare hardware. And if they, if they made a mistake in their script, rather than um, just restarting the container, they had to re-image the hard disk for an entire physical machine. Um, but as, as I say, it took quite a while for them to get the setup built, but um, utterly reliable, and you always had guaranteed state, which, which was fascinating, but obviously quite restrictive. So um, a guy called Luke Caney's turned up on the list and started talking about, I, I've, 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 got, the, I've got this idea for a, for a better automation system. Um, so I, we, we got to watch him musing for a bit. And he, eventually, he came up with this thing called Puppet, which you, I suspect you will have heard of. Um, which was kind of cool. Um, I, I, I like the fact that it tries to be declarative and that it tries to converge systems. Um, and the Puppet, I regard as very much the uh, first sort of generation two automation tool. Um, then... 
Oh, and I, I, I will point out, Luke Caney switched from Pearl to Ruby to write that because at that point he was like, I need more OO than I can get out of Pearl. And this was 2002 or so. So, you know, okay, if, 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 if anybody ever gets me a time, I'm going to go back and airdrop a copy of Moose. Um, and we didn't have Pearl. Um, later on, though, I was hanging out on Ash Catalyst, talking to the guy who wrote um, Catalyst Action Rest, um, and this one of the reasons he was working on rest support for Catalyst was that um, a systems automation tool based around HTTP. The idea being that he changed config um, values by doing puts to somewhere, and then the machine basically did get slash machine name slash etc slash hosts and wrote that to etc hosts. Um, and that, that, was, that was Holloway, who was a great bloke. Um, and he, he, he started thinking about um, a next generation of this tool. Um, and when, I, and was, the, the goal here was to have what he referred to as single copy Nirvana. So basically, he had a Catalyst application serving these files, and that was his point of truth. Um, and then all of the machine configs were derived from that. When he, when he was working, for the ne working on the next version, though, we, we spent days discussing what we wanted out of systems automation tools. Um, and then he, then, he, then he dropped the really sad thing on me, which is all of my customers are Rails startups. So the sysadmins only understand Ruby, so I'm going to have to write it in that. I, it, seriously, he was so unhappy about this, but it, it was the sensible choice for the company he was working for at the time. Um, and um, again, I, I, I think you probably will have heard of the end result because uh, that, that was the guy who wrote Chef. <laughs> Which is also, I suspect, one of the reasons why when the uh, Ruby backend started being a giant bag of dicks, um, he went, yeah, okay, and rewrote it in Erlang. No, no, no real attachment to Ruby there. I mean, you know, the, the Ruby community is like, Chef is our thing. It was, but no, no, it was a Perl programmer who had customers who were using Rails and therefore had to use Ruby even though he didn't want to. Uh, <laughs> although I, mu I must admit, Chef, Chef proves that, you know, Ruby is actually a really nice DSL host. It's just not a very good programming language. Uh, anyway, um, the thing about all of these systems, though, is they're built around the idea of wanting to own your system. Yeah? They, if, if, if it manages a file, it owns the entire file. If it manages a system, it owns the system. So it, it, it's very much the sort of idea of it's configuration management in the sense of you configure it and it manages the systems. Um, and I, that's all right. That, that's, that's fine for like um, cloud images where you can just tear it down and replace it if there's any sort of problem. But um, I'm, I'm not fond of that model for general server administration. Um, and the big reason for this is the development server problem, right? Um, how, may, I mean, how many places have you seen that do have automation for deployment, but then the development servers are basically outside of... Um, the normal automation thing, because it's a dev box. So sometimes you want to mess around with configuration on it. And, you know, if you mess around with configuration on a dev box, and then the automation tool comes along and overwrites the thing that you were trying to test, it's not kind of a happy thing. Um, my, my usual example for this is etc. hosts, right? Your, your sort of... The, the basic contents of etc. hosts, yeah, totally predictable. Development server, sometimes you, wanna, you want to add random extra host names because you're trying to emulate a four machine cluster. So you want to add four, ho four host names that all point at 127 dot something. Um, and you just want to do that for a day and then take it off again. You don't, you don't want to do anything complicated, you know. You, you should be able to do that just by editing the file and not have your automation system murder you. Um, but it, it doesn't work. Um, I'm still disappointed. I never quite managed to convince Holloway of this. Um, but I understand why, 
which is before he started doing um, basically startup deployment bootstrapping, his previous job was at a finance company with heavy auditing requirements. So in their case, if somebody ever hand edited a config file, they had what you might refer to as an HR problem. <laughs> As in, it was absolutely correct for the automation system to overwrite the file again. The only thing that couldn't be automated was the part where you tracked down whichever idiot had done that and fired them. Um, but, you know, out, out in the world where we're not in finance, it's kind of nice to be able to have um, close control. Um, the other thing that, that things don't really seem to do properly is nothing, has, nothing really has the equivalent of make minus n. I want to be able say, to say to you, if I asked you to do this, what commands would you run? Don't run anything yet, just tell me what you were going to do. And they don't do it. it drives me insane. A lot of, most systems, what you have to do is tweak the configuration, run the tool, let it modify your system, go and see if it modified the system correctly. Um, so if, it modified, if, if, if you messed up the configuration, it modifies the system, the system falls over, you've no idea what went wrong. Now, now, now you get to restore from backup and try and figure out what the hell happened. Oh. No fun at all. So, um, and the, you, you also have the thing of, um, oh, what the... Yeah, I'm, 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 lo I'm looking at this slide and going, what the hell was I supposed to be talking about about this one? So, um, uh, next slide. Uh, <laughs> right, but the, the, the whole, um, ah, yeah, the, the, always overwriting a file is, it's the brute force approach. Okay, there's, the brute force, is, brute force is all very well, but it's a choice. Um, and the, 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 what, what I want is a system that asks, is this mine? As in, it's totally okay to completely replace the contents of the file if the current contents of the file are a previous version that I wrote. Yeah? So, you know, if, 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 if the tool knows that it generated what's currently in there, then yeah, you can just replace it. But if, if what's currently in there isn't something that was only generated by the tool, then, okay, overwriting is an option. Maybe you want to keep a copy of it first. Uh, maybe you want to go, no, actually, I'm not sure what's going on. Because at the end of the day, if that file's been hand-edited, it was hand-edited by somebody with root. This is, the, the configuration management systems are meant to be in the service of the people with root. Yeah? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I don't like tools that think they know better than I do. My servers, damn it. You know, um, and the, so I, I was sort of fascinated by the idea that one of the possibilities, thank you all, uh, one of the possibilities would be um, basically if it's not sure what to do, why can none of these things file a ticket, right? I mean, I, I think, I think mo most of us have an RT install or, you know, an install of some inferior copy of RT in an inferior programming language, right? Um, I will, I, will, I will state for the record here, I hate RT, but I hate every other ticketing system I've ever had the misfortune to use much more. <laughs> it's one of those things, right? Ticket systems, project management software, CMSs. Those three types of software, you cannot make one that you don't hate. All you can do is try and make it as little hateful as possible for as many people as possible. Um, because, I mean, you go, hey, I, I, could build a syst I could build a system that does exactly what I wanted. And you, yes, you could. And you, you end up with a system that handles your own personal choice of workflow perfectly, but then everybody else who tries to use it hates it more than everything else because their brain doesn't work that way. Um, to um, to uh, steal a gag from uh, Mauka, basically... Re re reinvent, trying to reinvent a ticketing system is about on the same level as, use, as useful nurses trying to write yet another monad tutorial for Haskell. Um, yeah. So, um, I've, during my investigation, I fell over a thing called Nix. 
Nyx is fascinating. I, 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 I would seriously recommend having a look at this. Um, it's, it's a build system, but it's, basic, it's a pure functional build system. Um, so the idea with Nyx is when you build a piece of software, it goes into a unique directory. Um, you basically uses a SHA-1 sum of the result. Um, so I, this, this is great. You know, Nick, 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 Nix and Git, software that, software that lots of people absolutely rely on in production, built on the assumption that SHA-1 hashes will never collide. Now, admittedly, we seem to have done okay so far, but it, it, it's, it, 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 it's one of those, one day this is going to bite somebody on the ass and they're not going to be happy. But for the meantime, it's good enough, right? Um, but the, the, the idea is fantastic because any other piece of software that's built is linked explicitly against the versions of its dependencies that you build it against. So you deploy those directories and you're guaranteed to get exactly the piece of software that you did. Um, and then... <coughs> But they ignored what I think is kind of one of the more interesting things. Because it, it, it can solve for dependencies, but it still requires base, a thing, it has a thing called a channel, which is the equivalent of a particular app repository or whatever. So you have basically a set of blessed versions of everything. And you just rely on the fact that, the, that if A depends on X and Y and Z, then at all times the channel will provide versions of X, Y, and Z that work with the current A. And it's all very well, but given, you know, stuff, stuff can be released with more dependency information than that. You know, the, um, the CPAN meta spec has room for conflict information. Um, I, I, I sort of feel like you should be able to do at least some of that resolution automatically. Um, and I mean, the, the, the traditional problem is, okay, you have um, X needs 1.1 or higher of a particular piece of software. Um, y needs greater than 1.0. But 1.1.12 has a bug in it that breaks Y, right? So... Um, the, 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 when, you, when you're going through the resolution process, you should be able to go, okay, X needs at least 1.1. What's the latest version we've got? 1.1.12. Okay, we will provisionally use that. You get onto Y, it goes, it only needs 1.0, this should be fine. Ah, it can't use that, right? All of the current systems at this point are going to basically go, well, fuck you, this isn't consistent, bye register a conflict, emit a large error message, and exit. And what I'm sort of going is, why can't the software figure out on its own that it could try 1.1.11, yeah? <laughs> it, it, it should not be that hard. Um, so, you end it, but that, the, the problem with that is then, you end up with a situation where you need multiple copies of the same package installed. Um, so I went digging through um, different package management systems, and DPKG can't handle it at all. Um, the really sad thing is, there was a proposal to add multiple version support to DPKG. Um, <laughs> the problem is, the guy who proposed it said, I am willing to add multiple version support to DPKG. And also, in the process of doing it, we're going to rename and renumber every single Debian package to my new no versioning scheme because mine is better. You c At which point the DPKG developers went, you're a fucking idiot, go away. And I, I entirely understand this, but the thing is he'd managed to annoy them so much that when I came along three years later and basically went, could, could we potentially do multi-version? They still had the, they had the association in their head of multi-version with that idiot and just, just weren't interested at all. Um, so, yeah. 
screwed by the fact that a, that a stupid person had previously proposed the perfectly reasonable idea. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I kept digging around. The funny thing is, there is one tool that can actually do it fine. And it's RPM. Which is great, except, well, it, I mean, it handles it. It handles it fine. But it's RPM. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I am not, I am not, I am not going to deploy Perl software on Debian using RPM. Because the sysadmins would murder me. <laughs> I have dealt with Red Hat Enter for a prize Linux enough already. Not doing it again unless somebody pays me to. Seriously. If, 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 if Shadowcat acquires a customer running on Red Hat, our first question is, why are you doing that? Followed by, does anybody want to migrate to Debian? <laughs> and a, a, a lot of the times it turns out that the Perl development team's response is, yes, please, 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 can we escape? Uh, <laughs> seriously, re re recent Red Hats drive me insane. You know, um, because you install the Perl package and there's no cpan.pm. And no test modules, because you're on, a, you're on a Red Hat Enterprise machine. Why would you ever want to, want to compile anything locally? You should get it all from RPMs. If you actually want a complete Perl install, you have to install the Perl-core package. The reason they did it, they did this, Debian, Debian has a Perl-core Perl package that's the basics for embedded systems and a Perl package that's the complete thing. Why did Red Hat do it the other way around? Because the Fedora team decided that it was too hard to change the dependencies on all the Perl using packages. Well, thank you very much. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so um, another thing I ran into that was absolutely fascinating was um, BPL, Business Process Execution Language. This, this, this was from the era when, when the entire world was going to be soap. Um, happily, we don't live in that future. Uh, <laughs> but BPL was really interesting, because the, the idea was it, it was an orchestration language. Um, so basically, BPL was an executable XML document, because that's always a good idea. Um, that specified how to basically do multiple requests to different enterprise SOAP services. Um, I, 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 it was absolutely fascinating. The one thing that I thought was really interesting was that it recognized that it was operating outside of normal transaction boundaries. So it had an idea of compensation actions. As in, um, if you're running three steps, if step three fails, your compensation actions define how to undo steps one and two. So you're now back to as close to a consistent situation as you can be. Um, anyway. Come back to the, the horrible, the horrible, evil minus N problem. Um, which led me to Haskell. And I, I've, I've, I've probably hated more Monad tutorials than I have ticketing systems by now. Um, I, still, I still claim I only sort of understand Monads, but well, well enough to steal some ideas, um, not well enough to actually be able to write Haskell. Uh, <laughs> but um, Mo, the way Haskell uses Monads for I.O. fascinates me um, because... Because Haskell's pure functional, yeah? You can't, ha you can't actually have side effects exactly within the model. So the way monadic I.O. works um, is that your function basically takes a complete state of the world and returns a value representing the new state of the world. So within the program, it's pure functional, but you can still actually do things to the outside world. 
Um, okay. There is also still the option of unsafe perform I.O., but um, unsafe perform I.O. is in the category of if you use this and it breaks, you get to keep all the pieces, and there will probably be lots of them. <laughs> so anyway, um, but th that idea fascinated me. Um, and carrying on from there, I fell across Prolog. Prolog is it's, it's actually kind of cool. Um, designed in the 70s by insane French people. What could... Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Um, I also... And, and although although I, I, am, I, am, I am quite happy because the insane French people managed to come up with a name that is sensible in English as opposed to um, another project I looked at designed by insane French people, um, which was a theorem proving system called COQ. You any idea how hard it is to have a conversation in the pub about this week I have mostly been learning cock? <laughs> Seriously. Then again, my... My, my initials are the French for sexually transmitted disease, so you know, French people have enough trouble keeping a straight face talking to me in the, per in the first place. Um, though I, I will still never understand why um, Larry decided to call the Pulse its grammar std.pm. It's like, well done. Well done. All, all of the English people are sniggering now, and so are half of the Americans. Uh, Anyway, um, yeah, let, 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 let's just not go down that road. Anyway, Prologue. Prologue is short for Programmation Logique, hence the title of my talk being a bad joke on that. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing about Prologue is um, it's, it's all based around a concept called predicates, um, which aren't exactly... Um, they kind of look like function calls, but they really aren't. Because um, the, the, the idea of a predicate is it expresses truth. You have bound and unbound variables. So um, do I have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go back to this slide. Good. I wasn't sure if I duplicated it three slides on. I would have gone through the deck and actually known this, but um, yeah, the only VGA cable is over there. <laughs> this caused a little, a little bit of confusion. Anyway. Um, the idea of this is, if you, if you pass it this and server and package both have a value, then it returns true if that package is installed on that server, or it returns false if it isn't. But, if you pass it, if server is set to something but you haven't sent pa set package to anything, it returns multiple times once per package on that server with the package variable set to it. So basically, this one expression you can use for is package X installed on server Y, or give me a list of all packages installed on this server, or give me a list of all servers that have this package installed on it. And it means all of the same things because all of those are a way to make that true. Um, which, is, which is kind of the thing. Prologue, prologue is not about taking actions. It's about producing an end result for which your program is valid. Um, which becomes a really interesting idea. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost kind of, kind of mathematical. Um, pro, prologue got used quite a bit for um, AI research, um, at least in Europe. Um, while at the same time the Americans were using LESP um, and then the AI winter came along and kind of killed both of them. Which is a shame. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 all, I'm also kind of fond of LESP. People often accuse me of attempting to write LESP in Perl. Um, and yeah, I kind of probably am, but whatever. Um, but the, the, the idea of, of seeking a proof interested me. Um, because you, you, you can go down some fascinating routes with that. Um, because, you know, from my point of view, 
if I say to my automation system, I want it to be true that my web server is configured and running. I'm, I'm kind of reasonably happy with any path it takes to get to that, um, so, long as it tells, so long as it can tell me what it's going to do first. Um, and then, then, then in, in my wandering, I ended up playing with TCL, um, which I suspect I'm technically supposed to pronounce tickle, but I'm going to keep calling it TCL because I just... My, my brain has lodged on to calling it TCL, um, and I, I don't care. Um, I, I'm, I, I think, to, to, be, to be entirely honest, uh, mo 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 most TCL fans are more excited about the fact that there are still people alive who like TCL um, than they are about whether or not I pronounce it correctly. But seriously, uh, TCL is really cool. It's, it's one of those languages that um, is really awesome but kind of gets ignored. Um, it's kind of like a lisp made out of strings. Um, so when I, when I picked up TCL, my first thing was, damn it, another language that doesn't have unless. Um, and I was able to write unless for TCL as a first class keyword in about five lines of code because braces in TCL are actually the single quote. So, so when, you have, when you have a routine that you pass a block to, it's just a string and you call eval on it. Um, and TCL caches the, the compiled representation, so it's not, it's not evil in the way that string eval in Perl is potentially evil. Um, it actually works. Um, but yeah, uh, TCL is really neat. And we come back to Perl. I, I was originally giving this talk at um, a uh, sysadmin conference. Um, so yeah, <laughs> this was my explanation of why I'm using Perl. Um, and if you want to claim that Ruby's OO is good enough, um, you haven't used Moose. And if you still want to claim that, then why is somebody trying to port Moose to Ruby because they're pissed off typing all of the crap required because Ruby's OO is shit? Um, fascinatingly, somebody's also trying to port Moose to Python. Um, Oh, juice. Yeah, yeah. I, the, 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 oh, good. Ju, ju, juice was fascinating because he actually um, wrote it so that he could serialize a moose object on the server side and deserialize it into a juice object on the client side. And it was really cool, except that bootstrapping an entire meta protocol on page load is kind of no. Um, also, to be, to be entirely honest, the big, in my opinion, the biggest problem that you have with JavaScript is being too clever and ending up in a tangled knot. Having the full power of Moose just makes it easier to do that. Um, anyway, um, so we, we, we come back to Meg. Um, the worst backwards compatibility story in the world. The guy who wrote Make realized two months after he'd written it that tabs were a stupid idea, but he didn't change it because six of his colleagues in the lab had started using it and he didn't want to break their make files. Wow! <laughs> he, 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 is, he is going to go to his grave still feeling guilty about that decision, seriously. Um, anyway, um, but... It, one of the things that you need out of automation stuff um, is debuggability, which is where in minus n is important. Um, and also, you know, predictability in that this is going to do the right thing. Um, and the, the final thing is you need to be able to reproduce. You need to be able to do it again and end up with the same result. Um, but yeah, um, so I, I, I keep getting the response of you using what when I talk about this. Because, you know, um, most Perl people seem to not quite get TCL. Um, most of the TCL people definitely don't get Perl. And the Prolog people, uh, yeah, Haskell people, just, just... Yes, okay, I'm very glad that you understand monads. 
Would you like, please, please stop looking disappointed at me and go write an extra tutorial or something. Um, and, you know, as for the prologue people, well, wait, there are still prologue people? I found an IRC channel on Freenode. There's, 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 there's almost six people in there. Um, anyway, um, so the, the idea I came up with, and, yeah, I have just under 10 minutes left, so I'm going to end up going through this part quite quickly, but this is fine. Um, the idea of a solver. Um, so you, you have the idea of, for dependencies, you go an environment, think, you know, a, a tree of modules or whatever, satisfies a requirement. If there exists some build that can satisfy it, and that build exists within the environment. Um, but then you have to deal with transitive dependencies. So what you end up saying is, for each transitive requirement, we, um, that's a list of the requirements of, you go. And th th this is your standard recursive dependency resolution. Um, but uh, um, but the, the, so you, you end up with a result of true or false, except because I stole the monadic concept, um, this system can return maybe. Uh, and the idea of maybe is it would be it's false, but if you run this set of commands, it will be true. So, for example, it, it, it can come up with possible solutions. So if you're missing a dependency, one possible solution is install a binary package. Another possible solution is fire up your CPAN client of choice and build an installer. Um, and from, from the point of view of a logic engine, they're both first-class solutions, which means you, you, you can have equivalence between binary and, uh, you know. So you, you basically have the idea of um, pure actions that just set a value within the equation you're trying to solve and external actions that actually change the world. Um, now, while you're solving, the actions return, this is what I expect to happen if you run me. Um, so it can carry on and complete the work without having to run anything. And then the idea is you solve once and then run the first action, rerun the solve process. So, you know, you install the first package it said to install and then you work through again. So it always, the, 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 the idea is that, it will, is that a system will always end up rechecking its working. Um, and you can actually potentially run several. I mean, say you're, say you're creating three directories and then writing a file in each of them. You can run all three muktiers up front. Um, then you resolve and get right three files, and that's fine. Um, so I, I experimented with this by writing an SSH key manager, um, which, does, which does sort of work. Um, this is, this is the problem with conference-driven development. You finish a prototype for a conference, leave the conference, and immediately realize all the things that were wrong with the prototype, which is why I spent lots of time on the slides explaining the thought process, um, because I, I, I am now several months on, and I really hate the current prototype, but I don't have a new one written yet. Um, that's okay. It's all fine. At the point at which I get to 13 years without a successful result, then I'll start worrying, you know. Um, but yeah, so uh, the, the, the idea is you could have a rule like this to describe uh, a .ssh directory. Um, and that, that's, that's reasonably simple. What you do is you call this with the account name, account being user at host, and it binds the .ssh directory for you. But it can also go, oh, there isn't one there already. At which point, it will issue the, it will set up the actions for create the .ssh directory and chmod it for you. Um, so, but the, the, the interesting part is, so you, you build up to an authorized keys file similarly. The fun part is, key installed on. So that goes and finds the authorized keys file and says, is the line for your public key in that file? But this is prolog style, right? So I can call that with an account and a public key, and it'll, it'll tell me, is that public key installed on that machine? Or I can call it with just an account, 
and it will return me a list of the public keys that are currently installed. Um, and if I run it for a machine where, the public, where that particular key isn't installed, the contains line predicate goes, well, it's false currently, but if you let me add the line to the file, it would be true. Um, and therein, you start being able to actually take actions, but it's always in a situation of being able to tell you what it was going to do before it does it. Um, and then the fun part is, the config system, basically, I have a .keymangler directory with a file that contains the keys. Um, and then I use the same contains line thing. So when you're in a mode where that file is marked as you're not allowed to change this, that then gives me all of the keys. But I've actually got a configuration command of add a config entry that uses the exact same code. Um, because contains line still works the same way. So you end up with a config file that you can manage with VI, but can also manage interactively through the solver code. And I, I think building up on that, kind of like the way, um, you know, you'd, depending on what sort of mood you're in, you can either do git remote add whatever, or you can just go, I can't remember the git commands again, vi.git slash config, it will be fine. Um, so and you basically end up with, with three concepts. Query mode, which is you are not allowed to take any external action, which, is, which allows you to say, is something currently true? Solve, which is basically um, give me the list of actions. Um, and a third command, ensure, which basically runs the solve process, and then if it required actions, goes and runs the actions to do it. So um, you end up with, uh, with a stanza like that. I have about uh, two minutes left. Um, so status is basically you run a query and get the result. Um, sync is the ensure mode, but you can always have a minus n, equivalent to make minus n. You can always get it to tell you what it's going to do, and my god, I wish everything else did that. Um, I got shouted at at the German Pearl Workshop a few years back by saying, you know, the one reason I can see why you might use module build is if you're targeting Windows. And three German sysadmins stood up and interrupted the talk. And you know, bear in mind, this is, this is German people in a lecture theater. That, that, that's serious business if they're going to interrupt the talk. And they said, we are Windows admins, and we would like to say, please, God, never use module build. Because every time we get a build failure from it, we have no idea how to debug it. While make on Windows is horrible, at least we can debug that when it breaks. Um, which came as kind of a shock to me. Um, but but, the, but one of the, I mean, you can do stupid things. I don't know if anybody else has done this. But when short of time, I have run make minus n gone, it's missing a flag. I don't know why it's missing a flag. Screw it. Make minus n, pipe, pull minus pe, substitution regex on the frigging compiler commands, pipe shut. Right, it's built. I'm going for lunch. Um, so yeah, and so coming back to this, hopefully, hopefully there's now some visibility into how um, this can be used, this same code can be used for do I have all of my dependencies, but also figure out a consistent set of dependencies and install them. Um, and because Prolog is designed to basically, it backtracks and tries another choice when it runs into a logical impossibility, this particular problem just solves itself because it gets down to the not 1.12 requirement and goes, bugger, inconsistent. Roll back, goes back, tries the second option, which is 1.1.11, which works. So the actually being able to handle conflicts, once you've done all of the rest of this work, you effectively get for free. Um, and you, you can similarly do it for adding lines to a host file without deleting lines that were already there. Um, I'm, I'm, I also suspect that with a little um, cleverness in a parser, I can do it for things like JSON config. Um, so, if you look on git.shadowcat.co.uk, there is a repository that has um, the key mangler code and the current prototype. Um, I would not suggest actually using this 
merely looking at it and stealing ideas. Um, but yeah, this is where I'm up to currently. Hopefully, hopefully next year. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Say, say, saying hopefully next year I'll have, I'll have a complete version to a Pearl conference, is, is, it's not a good plan. Um, I think I'm getting somewhere. Keep an eye out. I'm sure you'll hear about it when I finally get something working. Because when, it, because when I get a prototype that I'm actually happy with, I will be running around telling absolutely everybody about it anyway. Um, so I, 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 I apologize for that being a bit rambly, but um, hopefully there were some interesting ideas in it. And I am now over time, so thank you very much. <laughs>